Well, good morning. good morning. Today we're going to be continuing in the book of Acts. So please turn with me to chapter 15. I'm going to start at verse 36. And let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for revealing your will to us in your word. And this morning we ask you to teach us and encourage us with your word in this passage. And we ask you to enrich and renew our minds in some way. And we thank you for this opportunity to receive your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, up to this point in chapter 15, we've seen the issue of circumcision and a law being forced upon Gentile believers. Gentile believers do not have to become Jews. They have the law of liberty and can worship God in Christ as Gentiles. And this is where we pick up in verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. But Judas had returned home to Jerusalem, and Silas stayed with Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, where they were teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. And after a short time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and Visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Paul wanted to see how they were and, and how they have developed spiritually. He was concerned about the Judaizers that have gone ahead to those churches also and was trying to tell them that they need to be circumcised. They need to obey you know, the law. All the Gentile believers needed to hear this decree that came from the apostles. They wanted to go to these churches that they established. I mean, these churches are like their children. You know, somebody's coming in and infesting their children with false teaching. You know, they want to get out there and straighten it out. Um, Paul felt they need to deal with these Judaizers that are troubling them. So as Paul was talking to Barnabas about this, they came to a disagreement about who should go with them? Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So John Mark was Barnabas' cousin, and he wanted to take him along with them. But Paul did not want him to go along because of their, in their previous trip he had deserted them uh, in Pamphylia. We're not told why he left, but he did leave their mission and went back home. And this disagreement became impassable. Neither one was willing to compromise. So they each went their own way. Barnabas took Mark and went to Cyprus, and Paul took Silas and went the land route, land route through Syria and Cilicia. Verse 39, Luke stated that this is a sharp disagreement. The BDAG defines this as a state of irritation expressed in argument, sharp disagreement. The text says that they disagreed sharply over this issue, but there's no statement or implication that they ended up disliking each other, and uh, as some commentators uh, infer. With a 2020 hindsight, it can easily be seen that both Barnabas and Paul having prophetic gifts, that possibly the Holy Spirit could have been guiding them both in order to have two missionary journeys going out to evangelize. There's no reason to insist that their separation wasn't at least somewhat friendly. Paul later wrote with respectful admiration for both Barnabas in 1 Corinthians 9 and John Mark in Colossians 4, 
uh, Philemon 24, 2 Timothy 4. A hot-tempered fight makes for a good movie or story, but it's not required in the biblical narrative. Their decision to go in separate directions certainly resulted in a greater gospel expansion since more people became involved as fellow missionaries and they covered more area in less time. Constable concludes that Barnabas's desire to offer John Mark another opportunity was certainly commendable and gracious, even though Paul viewed it as unwise. Many of God's servants would have dropped out of ministry had it not been for a gracious Barnabas in their life who was willing to give them another chance after they failed. We have on the map two missionary journeys now. The green line shows Barnabas and Mark heading to Cyprus. And I'm, we're, we can assume that they went to points beyond. Now this is the last mention of Barnabas and John Mark in the book of Acts. In the early church, there may have been several missionaries like Barnabas going out to the Gentiles. We don't hear their stories. Their stories aren't included in Luke's account because he wrote his account in order to follow Peter and then to follow Paul. He mentions others only as they come in contact with Peter and Paul. In fact, Peter is not mentioned in the book of Acts after verse 7 in chapter 15. We won't hear from him anymore. It's now all about the Holy Spirit working through Paul. So since that's Luke's, where Luke's going, that's what we're going to be seeing. That doesn't mean that nothing else happened out there. The red line on the map is Paul and Silas's journey. In verse 40 and 42, we see that Paul and Silas departing from Antioch with the church's blessing, and this time the missionaries traveled by land, going north through Syria and then through Cilicia, where Paul had been born and had previously labored. They strengthened the young churches in those Roman provinces. And just as Barnabas went first to his home territory in Cyprus, Paul also went to his home territory, Tarsus. It could also be that Paul had already planted churches around this area. In fact, I'm certain that he, he had because he'd spent several years in Tarsus before he was called to Antioch. So he spent, the, uh, uh, he spent those years planting churches all around the Antioch area. And as we could see after Tarsus, then he revisited Derby, Lystra, Asian Antioch, and made his way to Tro Troas before heading into Greece or Macedonia. The specific ministry of Paul and Silas was to strengthen these churches. And at this point, they were not totally focused on evangelizing and church building, but discipling, showing that there's room in ministry for both evangelism and discipling. Going into chapter 16, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he is well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So in this chapter, we're introduced to Timothy. He's called a disciple, which shows that he's already a believer. And according to 1 Timothy 1-2, Paul led him to the Lord during his first missionary trip there. In Greek, the name Timothy is Timotheus, meaning God-honored. The name appears 17 times in the 10 Pauline epistles. Timothy is mentioned more frequently than any other of Paul's other companions. Two of Paul's letters, 1 and 2 Timothy, were addressed to him. Timothy was to become one of Paul's closest friends and most faithful fellow workers. And from his letters to Timothy, more things can be known about Timothy than are revealed to us in Acts. For example, Timothy was trained in the scriptures 
from childhood. His mother was Jewish. Her name was Eunice, and she was also a believer as a result of Paul's first missionary journey. His Jewish grandmother was Lois. His father was a Greek, Gentile, but his name is not known. Biblically, Jewishness is traced through the father, and because Timothy's father was a Gentile, Timothy's Jewish identity might be a matter of question. So verse 2 reveals Timothy's reputation. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. And this shows that Timothy had the approval of the local churches in his own area. Timothy may have been very well commissioned by the elders of the church of Lystra. In 1 Timothy 14, Paul writes, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So it could have been that he was that Timothy was an elder of the churches there. On a side point, please notice that when Luke introduces us to those who work with Peter or Paul, he always seems to mention their reputation. That's very important. There's like a preoccupation with the character of these men who assume Christian leadership. And uh, this becomes a, you know, a feature of the story in the book of Acts. Probably should be featured in the story of our churches today. In verse 3, we see recorded the circumcision of Timothy. Paul took him and had him circumcised. Paul obviously did not circumcise Timothy because he believed that the rite was necessary for his justification or his sanctification. Um, he did so because it was necessary for effective evangelistic ministry among the Jews. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 gives us a look at Paul's belief about circumcision. <clears throat> Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He's not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone be called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that commission, uh, condition in which he was called. But Paul circumcised Timothy because it was necessary for effective evangelistic ministry among the Jews. Constable notes that unbelieving Jews would not have given Paul a hearing if he had traveled with an uncircumcised Gentile. And even though Timothy was half Jewish, the Jews regarded an uncircumcised son of a Jewish mother to be an apostate Jew, a violator of the Mosaic Covenant. And we can continue to see Paul's attitude and character uh, about evangelizing and, and doing things like this in 1 Corinthians 9.20, where he talks about to the Jews, I become as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. So Paul is willing to be, put himself under the law in order to reach those who are under the law. To those who are without law is without law, though not being without law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I might become a fellow partaker of it. The bottom line is Paul would do anything. He'd sacrifice anything if it made it easier for another person to believe in Jesus Christ. He didn't want to do anything that would become a stumbling block in his, that other person's life. He'd do anything to have a good witness. So back to Acts 16, verse 4. Now while... They were passing through the cities. They were delivering the decrees, 
which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Part of Paul's ministry, including acquainting the churches of, in Galatia with the directives that were formulated at the Jerusalem Council. Gentiles did not have to be circumcised. They only had to love their Jewish brethren by refraining from things that would ruin fellowship between the Jews and the Gentile brethren. The churches were not only growing stronger in the Lord, but they were also growing in numbers. Both numerical and spiritual growth are necessary. Notice which one comes first. So the church is being strengthened in the faith. And we're increasing in number daily. Is it possible that strengthening the churches in the faith might even be more important than increasing the numbers there? In verses 6 to 8, Paul or Luke records the next part of their journey. In verse 6, they, they pass through the, the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were, going, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, Mysia, they came down to Troas. So after Lystra, they went through Galatia and Phrygian uh, regions, visiting the churches there. But the Holy Spirit did not allow them to go south into Asia to visit the other, <coughs> other churches they had established. <clears throat> so they intended to go north towards Bithynia. The text doesn't say exactly how the Holy Spirit forbade them, but they are forbidden to go to western Asia Minor, where the key cities of Ephesus, Hierapolis, and Laodicea were located. Paul did go there later during his third missionary journey. We'll see that in Acts 19. So they went north toward Bithynia and Mysia. Their intentions were to go after uh, to go there to evangelize the cities in those regions. They were regions with many Roman cities located in them. But again, they were stopped by the Holy Spirit. So they bypassed Mysia and Bithynia and went straight to Troas. Now, Troas was on a coast of the Aegean Sea. Its full name was Alexandria Troas, founded by Alexander the Great in the 4th century B.C., near the ancient city of Troy. It was a free Greek city until Augustus Caesar made it a Roman colony. Troas was the seaport of Mysia and the main port of call for ships sailing between Asia Minor and Macedonia. And it is possible to see Greece across the Aegean Sea from this city. Paul would return to Troas at least twice, according to Acts 20 and 2 Corinthians 2. In Troas, Paul had a vision. <clears throat> in verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen this vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So this time God gave direction to Paul and Luke recorded and recorded that uh, he did so uh, in a vision. Uh, so Paul, I mean, God can lead us in many different ways. He can tell us not to go here. He can do, today, we don't maybe hear audible voices and things like that, but we can see the doors closed so we don't go that direction. And we're led to go in other directions. The, uh, the Holy Spirit can lead us and guide us in our daily walk, and especially in our ministry. The Lord was directing Paul and his companions to go to Macedonia. Macedonia was a Roman province that comprised roughly the northern half of ancient and modern Greece. Its name honored Philip of Macedonian, who was Alexander the Great's father. Today we'll recognize that as 
you know, the bottom portion of the European continent. Verse 10 records that the decision to go to Macedonia was immediate. God instructed them, gave them the instructions. They recognized that this was God giving it to them. And let's go. Why wait? And they immediately did what was necessary to go there. They had concluded that God had called them to preach the gospel to the Macedonians. And this use of the pronoun we and us in this verse shows that Luke himself joined Paul's party in Troas. He remained with them until Acts 16, verse 40, where the term we is dropped. And this section will be the, the first of four so-called we sections in the book of Acts, the sections in which Luke traveled with Paul. We'll see that again in 16, verse 10 to 17, chapter 20, verse 5 to 15, chapter 21, verses 1 to 18, and chapter 27, verses 1 to, to uh, 28, 16. In this passage, Luke doesn't tell us how they met up. Uh, sometimes these authors don't talk about themselves. <laughs> it's all about Jesus, you know. <laughs> In this case, it's all about Paul and the Lord working through Paul. But somehow Paul's in, I mean, Luke is there in Troas for whatever reason, and he joins up with Paul. Next week, we're going to see them cross over into the European continent or into the region of Macedonia. And we'll see what they do in Europe. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time we can be together hearing your word. We're really blessed in that we have the freedom to do so. There are many places in this world that meeting together is dangerous. And we pray for our brethren who live there. We ask you to give them your strength and courage to be witnesses in lands where witnesses can even suffer martyrdom. Bless them and let them know that you are with them and that the rest of the world is praying for them. We thank you also for those who are here with us today to fellowship, worship, and learn from your word. And we ask that you keep us all safe and return each one next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.